That is Grand Prismatic Spring, just north of the Old Faithful area. It is the second largest hot spring on the planet. Uh, the largest is in, is in uh, New Zealand, 185 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, all those colors you see uh, are different types of bacteria and algae growth mi and microbes that thrive, uh, one of the few places on the planet, that thrive on extremely hot water. And as the water cools, it supports different types of bacteria and hence those different colors. This is huge. You can see how big it is compared to the boardwalk with people on it in the background. So uh, a few years ago, we had a very severe winter. Uh, we lost almost uh, half of our herd of bison, almost 1,500 animals uh, to the severity of the winter. We had uh, record snow and weeks of uh, minus uh, Fahrenheit temperatures. But bison are very resilient. You're looking at the mating season in late July. Uh, these guys sometimes will fight to the death uh, over females. We also had a very uh, rare um, occurrence happen. Uh, this is now three years ago. Uh, a sow grizzly gave birth to four cubs, uh, very rare. Two is common, uh, three is rare, four is extremely rare. Um, she came out of hibernation the next year with only three. Um, this the little guy in the back didn't make it. Those of you that don't know, grizzly bears go in hibernation in Yellowstone uh, around the first week of November, and they emerge around the first week of March. When they go into hibernation, her heart rate goes down to three beats per minute. She doesn't urinate or defecate the entire winter. And she gives birth during hibernation. <clears throat> Which I think a lot of women would like to have happen. <laughs> <laughs> Here she is uh, coming out with only two of her cubs. This was the second year after that. Um, very hard to try and raise four. This is the male. Uh, not a, male grizzlies are not very, very good fathers. Um, one of their intents is to kill the young uh, because she only gives birth once every three years. The other two years are spent raising the young and he does not want to wait for that three year cycle to mate again. For the gentleman that hasn't been to Yellowstone, 2.2 <laughs> million acres, uh, bigger than Connecticut and Rhode Island put together, um, over 490 miles worth of roads. Uh, all the red lines are the road systems. This square down in the bottom, this little white square, in relationship to this whole map, that's the amount of development in Yellowstone, um, less than 2%. Basically, the road corridors in Yellowstone is the extent of the development. 98% of the park's visitors never leave the asphalt. So we've got 98% of our visitors on 2% of our property, which is really a good thing. Uh, we have over 600 grizzly bears in the greater Yellowstone area, over 400 black bears. The largest concentration of geothermal features on the planet. Um, we also have 3.5, 3.6 million visitors a year, which equates to about a million cars. So it's a very busy place, especially during June, July, and August. That's the Yellowstone Lake is the largest high elevation lake in North America. By that I mean above 7,000 feet in elevation. That is the largest lake in North America. It's over 400 feet deep. Well, by the way, uh, in the peak of the summer, Yellowstone has over 5,000 employees, over 2,000 hotel rooms, over 2,000 campsites. Uh, it's, a, it's a very busy place. We are also home to over 2,000 earthquakes a year. 
The blue dots are from the earthquakes that occurred a few years ago. This red dotted line that you see is the rim or caldera of the volcano, the super volcano that created the park. This is the largest volcano on the planet. The last three eruptions have been 600,000 years apart. The last eruption has been 640,000 years ago. So we're 40,000 years late on the next eruption. This is a big deal. When this guy goes off, and some geologists say it's getting closer, and I'll explain later if you want about why they think it's going to go off in the fu near future. Uh, when this guy goes off, um, it'll destroy most of the northwest United States, deposit up to six feet of ash as far away as Iowa, and the rest of the planet will be in indirect sunlight for the next hundred years. So you're in a good place if it goes off. <laughs> This is one of the first official expeditions to, to try and map what was to become Yellowstone Park. Uh, this is the uh, Hayden Expedition. The, a previous expedition a year earlier came back from Yellowstone. Nobody believed the story they were telling about geysers, hot springs, mud pots, wildlife, on and on. So this expedition in 1871, they were smart enough to take a very famous artist, Thomas Moran, and a very famous photographer, William Jackson, to capture the scenes of Yellowstone, what was to become Yellowstone Park. They took that information, those paintings and those photographs, back to Congress, back to the East, and to Congress, and convinced Congress to create Yellowstone as the world's first national park, which has been a template for other countries around the world. There's now over 4,000 national parks in the world, all modeled after Yellowstone. The original legislation that created the park on March 1st, 1872, this legislation passed by Congress still holds the record today as the fastest piece of legislation to work through Congress, less than eight days. There was no National Park Service at the time, you, this is the first time the U.S. government ever got in the business of managing public land. They didn't know what to do, like, the, like today. <laughs> <laughs> and so oh, there was no, they appropriated no funds for the park's protection. So in the following years, there was a lot of things that went wrong because there was nobody managing the park. This legislation, what's important, it, it, it gave the park two mandates, preserve and protect the park and provide for the enjoyment of the people. Very difficult balancing act uh, that we still, the park still deals with today. Because there was no National Park Service, as I mentioned, and no protection of the park, uh, we, there was a lot of poaching, people living in the park, illegal trapping and hunting. This picture was taken, this gentleman actually, that cabin is inside the park just south of Gardner, Montana, inside the park. You can see he's killed about everything imaginable. <laughs> uh, again, no control over the park. These folks uh, walking right up to the cone of Old Faithful Geyser. Uh, you, obviously very dangerous, very illegal today. Um, but this just illustrates um, that the, you know, what, there was no protection. By the way, the next time you watch Old Faithful, Keep this in mind. The eruptions now are every 93 minutes between eruptions. Uh, and that's one of the preludes that geologists say the big volcano's coming. Back in the 80s, the, the span between eruptions was 60 minutes. It's increasing all the time. Now it's up to 93 minutes. That water is 204 degrees as it comes out of the cone. Every eruption is 6,000 gallons of water, 204 degrees. And scientists recently have determined uh, through isotope analysis that that water, every single eruption, uh, that water is over 600 years old. So the water you see coming out of Old Faithful in your next visit uh, was surface water or snow melt before Christopher Columbus. 
The very sensitive terraces up in the Mammoth Hot Springs area, again, illustrates no protection of the park. People would climb on these, take off, break off chunks of souvenirs, and do irreversible damage to this resource. Again, go wherever they wanted to. Uh, one taking of the resources. Uh, this guy not only caught a lot of fish, but eight women. <laughs> <laughs> so because of this type of activity, in 1886, the U.S. Cavalry was brought in uh, under uh, Colonel Sheridan. Uh, he came into the park, uh, set up camp, and at the peak of their uh, occupation, over 250 uh, cavalry men and officers and their families occupied Yellowstone, a very sought-after position in the, in the military, uh, a lot better than going to work with General Custer. <laughs> but in any event, very, very sought-after uh, <clears throat> duty. This is Fort Yellowstone, which today you probably recognize as Mammoth Hot Springs. Um, for those of you that are familiar, right over here is the, the post office, over here is the hotel. But in any event, all these buildings built by the cavalry uh, with local materials in the 1890s, all of these buildings are still used today by Park Service staff for offices and employee housing. <clears throat> One of the main reasons the park, uh, or the cavalry came into the park, was because of uh, blatant poaching going on in the park. In 1904, there were 10 bison left in Yellowstone, virtually the west. Um, for example, these bison, they, after they caught this poacher, these bison were killed for nothing more than their tongues and gallbladders, which were considered delicacies in Europe. It illustrates it again. Behind that guy, those are piles of bison skulls. Bad, bad. Here's the picture of the cavalry posing for a picture of the very resources they're supposed to be protecting. Um, this, these uh, buffalo soldiers, as they were called, they were on their way from Fort Missoula, Montana to Fort St. Louis and stopped in Yellowstone for this photo opportunity. They actually were experimenting, demonstrating a new form of transportation for the cavalry. So in the early 1890s, the railroad, the railroads realized the lucrative idea of bringing people into the park on, on rail line. They had proposed to build rail lines throughout Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Park. Um, the cavalry was all, the cavalry had swung the pendulum completely one way on this uh, legislation. They were all about preserving and protecting the park, and they really didn't give a damn about the visitor. Matter of fact, they tried to keep visitors out. They felt their job was to just preserve and protect the park. And this went on for decades. So they tried to keep people out. They were successful in convincing Congress to keep the rail lines out of Yellowstone. That's why the rail lines stopped and turned around in Gardner, Montana, in West Yellowstone, in Gallatin Gateway, south of Bozeman or Belgrade, uh, and also in Lander, Wyoming. Um, because the park, the cavalry would not allow the rail lines to come in. So people would get, as in this case, um, those of you that don't know, this is the <laughs> famous uh, arch, the Roosevelt Arch uh, in Gardner, Montana, the original entrance into Yellowstone. Once people got off the trains in Gardner or West Yellowstone, whatever, they would hop on stagecoaches. These stagecoaches would hold 36 people at a time. And they would begin their journey into the park. Back in these days, the average stay of the visitor was two weeks. Today, the average stay of the visitor in Yellowstone is 1.5 days. One of the other parks I worked at was Mount Rushmore uh, before Yellowstone. The average, for example, the average stay of the visitor in Mount Rushmore is 37 minutes. So, 1916, the cavalry left to go to World War I. At that point in time, the National Park Service was created, the National Park Service Ranger was invented, and took over uh, management of 
the national parks at the time, the big ones being Grand Canyon, Sequoia, Yosemite, and Yellowstone. They almost overnight swung the pendulum completely the other way and they were all about providing a quality visitor experience and really didn't give a damn about protecting the resources. And this went on for decades. Um, this wasn't our first ranger, but one of our most famous, that is former President Gerald Ford. So the reason the Park Service swung the pendulum the other way and they were all about visitor experience is because the parks were being threatened um, by lobbyists and politicians and developers arguing that why are we holding back all of these lands for a couple of thousand people a year to visit? Why don't we exploit it and have mining and timbering and extract and grazing? And a classic example is Yosemite, where at the time, this was in the early 1900s, only a couple of thousand people visited Yosemite. There was a proposal to build a dam in Yosemite, the Ketch Ketchy Dam, and by damming up the river, it would supply water to the entire city of San Francisco. And the argument was, why are we not building a dam that will supply water for a half a million people for the, versus the enjoyment of 2,000? And they won. And that dam is still in place today. And that's what was the threat that was to Yellowstone and other parks. So the Park Service, to make a long story short, tried everything they could in the following years to get visitation bolstered up high enough that it would justify their very, the park's very existence. Almost immediately, to bring more people in, which is something the cavalry fought for years, we allowed, right in 1916, right after the Park Service took control of the park, allowed private automobiles into the park. Speed limit was 25 miles an hour, and you can see why. <laughs> Park Service, again, to bring more people in, they tried everything they did to create that unique visitor experience. They purposely designed, engineered, and built roads as close to the natural features as possible so people could have drive-by viewings of Old Faithful, like you see, with a, from the comfort of, the, of their car. When you folks stand or have stood on that viewing platform at Old Faithful, you are standing right on that original roadbed. That takes the road used to go right out past Morning Glory Pool and all the way back out to the existing highway. This is the uh, railroad coming into Gardner, Montana. Uh, back in the early 20s, it was a rich man's park. It was a whole $59 to take a train from Chicago, Minneapolis to the park. You can see everybody's in shirts and ties. Uh, the average person could not afford to come to the park. We had public transportation figured out. People would get off the trains and hop into these multi-passenger vehicles and visit the park for their two-week visit. <clears throat> Historic Old Faithful Inn, built in 1904. Oops. So here is the same guy with his eight women in the winter time. <laughs> more and more visitors, longer and longer seasons to bring more and more people into the park. We allowed commercial development in the park off to the side. On, this right, on your right hand side, you can't see it, but is Old Faithful Geyser. Every time Old Faithful were to erupt, that 6,000 gallons of hot water was collected in a pipe and piped into this building. And for 50 cents, you could take a hot mineral bath with Old Faithful water. That was a great visitor attraction. Nowhere else on the planet that brought more and more people in. And if you know where to look, pieces of that foundation are still out there. We tried to get the roads open earlier and earlier, again, to allow more and more people in. This picture was taken the first week of June. And you can see the laborious task with those shovels of trying to clear a road. We allowed, we encouraged 
the feeding of wildlife, particularly bears, that was a great visitor attraction. Nowhere else could you do this. Park rangers taking this video, those are strips of raw bacon he's feeding that bear. <laughs> we have bleachers set up by open dumps where people would visit or could observe the bears. Look how close her hand is to his mouth. <laughs> So was there much mortality from that behavior? There was not. When that bag of food is empty, he would just go to the next human. Humans were their friends because they had food. <laughs> so this kind of behavior went on all the way until 1969, when it was finally realized this was not a good way to manage wildlife. And over, virtually overnight, all of the open dumps were closed. This kind of behavior was made illegal. And in the following years, there was a lot of human and bear fatalities because when the bears couldn't get food this way into the campgrounds they came. And so we had a whole generation of bears that, were, that their diet was human food. And it took a whole generation to get that weaned off. Fishing bridge, which probably a lot of you folks have been to. We allowed unlimited fishing of, of native cutthroat trout because it brought people into the park. We felt that all predators were bad in the park. All of the wolves, the, the government attempted to kill off all wolves, coyotes, mountain lions, lynx, bobcat, because they felt that they were not attractive animals for, for visitors and they were successful at eliminating the wolves. We felt, the Park Service felt that all fires were bad, flames and smoke did not attract visitors to the park. So for decades, all fires were put out immediately, whether they were natural, naturally caused or man caused. So over the decades, we had this tremendous fuel buildup over the years, and it all came to a head in 1988, because we had so much fuel and the conditions were right, and if you folks remember the 88 fires when over half the park burned, uh, the largest single firefighting effort still in U.S. history. So uh, today, typically called an animal jam. Uh, a lot of you folks have been through this. Uh, anything from a grizzly bear to a chipmunk up ahead. <laughs> you see people parked in the wrong lane, car doors fly open, total gridlock for hours. So we started looking at how we're doing business. We tried this, what we tried to do in the 1990s was swing the pendulum back to the middle, where it wasn't all visitor enjoyment, but a balance between visitor enjoyment and resource protection. And we're trying to still find that, that middle of the road. Uh, we introduced, we were the first national park in the country to introduce a renewable alternative fuel, that being biodiesel. Um, I'm proud to say that the, the original fuel for biodiesel was produced at the University of Idaho in Moscow with rapeseed and mustard seed, and that launched uh, a successful program in Yellowstone that has been replicated now in 42 other national parks, as well as a lot of uh, municipalities around the country. There are four public biodiesel pumps in the greater Yellowstone area, um, all a result of this one truck and the University of Idaho uh, spearheading the production of the fuel. Uh, when the University of Idaho produced the fuel, it was shipped to Mammoth Hot Springs. It was the only place this, that truck could refuel. Um, they wanted to get a lot of miles on that truck in a short amount of time, which was hard to do because the truck always had to come back to Mammoth to refuel. They didn't want any petroleum-based diesel in that vehicle. So we fabricated a 300-gallon tank in the back, um, that allowed us to go 6,000 miles uh, between Phillips. I drove that pickup from Yellowstone to Nashville, Tennessee and back without refueling. And if you think about the Palooza, the, that panhandle of Idaho where the rapeseed is, is, is growing, um, when we produced it into fuel, that truck gets around 2,500 miles per acre. Uh, 
there was there was concern that the fuel, well, the exhaust from the fuel would become a grizzly bear attractant because we're burning 100% uh, uh, biodiesel, which smells like French fry oil when it's burned uh, or cooking oil, and so that we take. Unlike in the past, we take grizzly bear management very, very seriously, and I'll talk about that in a second with garbage, but also this truck with its exhaust. So the truck was driven to Washington State University in Pullman, where they have captive grizzly and black bear for research projects. And we spent a week piping exhaust into the cages of these bears to observe if they were, in fact, attracted to the odor of the truck, uh, the exhaust of the truck. And it was concluded they, they, the bears were not attracted to it. Everything in Yellowstone is a challenge. Um, as a result of the success of that one truck, today everything that's diesel in Yellowstone uh, runs on a biodiesel blend, as well as stationary applications like boilers and generators. Uh, tour buses, both concessioner and park service, all run on a biodiesel blend, reducing by around 500 metric tons of CO2 going into the atmosphere every year. Our heavy equipment for removing snow, we don't use the shovels anymore. Um, all of this, uh, uh, it's a real test. All of this runs on a biodiesel blend. This is uh, up on the Beartooth Highway at the end of May. Uh, you can see the top of this snow stake marking the edge of the road. That snow stake is 16 foot tall. Took that picture last April 15th. Huge operation. Uh, 1,500 gallons of biodiesel are burned every single day. Prior to World War II, we had 400 of these old yellow buses. Um, the reason I bring this up, you'll either you've seen them in the park or you will see them. Uh, very attractive uh, prior to World War II. Uh, a canvas rollback top so people could stand up, take pictures, have that open air experience of being in the park. Um, after World War II, everybody fell in love with the, by the way, the park was completely closed during World War II. 1941 and 1946, the park was closed. When it reopened, a new generation of people, war is over, take, buy a station wagon, go see Yellowstone. Nobody wanted to ride in these old yellow buses. They were slowly auctioned off for $600 a piece. Uh, to the point where there was only two of them left. One is in our, in our historic uh, vehicle collection, and the other one we would use for VIP tours. And then we received an anonymous call about five, six years ago, uh, saying that there were eight of these buses up in Skagway, Alaska, being used by a tour operator. The Park Service sent me up there, and sure enough, there was a, uh, a tour operator giving tours of Skagway and eight old Yellowstone buses. They still had the original Yellowstone license plates on him. He swore he didn't know where they came from. <laughs> a deal was struck with our concessioners and the National Park Service to purchase those eight buses back from Alaska. They were sent to Detroit and refurbished and two or three years ago put back into service in the park. We now have uh, visitors waiting in line wanting to get out of their private automobiles into a form of public transportation because of the uniqueness and nostalgia of these old buses. Yep, Glacier's got the same thing with the old red buses. So these are the eight buses from Skagway, Alaska, being, after being refurbished, coming back into Yellowstone after being gone for over 70 years. By the way, uh, as a private citizen, you can uh, lease one of these for the day with a driver for a thousand dollars. It's a hell of a deal. You can put 13 people in it. A lot of people, we have a chapel in Mammoth. A lot of uh, what's becoming very attractive is people are getting married at the chapel in Mammoth Hot Springs and then the wedding party piles into one of these and they go see the park for the day. New yellow bus, we tried to replicate the old yellow bus uh, by the time we got uh, involved with uh, handicap accessibility requirements and safety requirements. They've got a little big on us, but anyway, we've got six of these. Uh, they're used for tours throughout the park. We also have some on loan to the city of Bozeman. Only from November until April, you can only get into the park on tracked vehicles, 
snow coaches or track vehicles like this or snowmobiles. You have a camera mounted up on the roof. There's a flat screen TV behind the seat of the driver when this bus is in the park and there's a bison or an elk or a bear 500 yards away. This camera zooms in on it, shows it on the flat screen behind the driver. Now the visitors, old, young, handicapped, can all enjoy wildlife without leaving the bus. The city of Bozeman has adopted the Art Yellow Bus design. They now have over a dozen buses providing free transportation to the public in the city of Bozeman all the way down to Big Sky. Embarked in a partnership with Toyota to demonstrate and educate visitors about hybrid technology. Uh, these Priuses, which were donated for them, you can see they're decaled up with different scenes of the park, which is a very attractive magnet to visitors. They see something like this in the park, they want to come up to it and ask what it's all about. These are purposely placed in high visibility areas like trailheads, animal jams, uh, visitor center parking lots, and, so, and we've made hundreds of thousands of contacts with visitors explaining about hybrid technology. It's been a huge success. So anyway, this is one of bears. Here's another one of bison. Uh, Toyota really wanted us to do decals of wolves, and we said it would be, it would be full of bullet holes in a day. So that was good. <laughs> anyway, here's an example of bear jam. The Prius is parked off to the side here. Once this bear goes away, all of these visitors just migrate over to that Prius, and this ranger begins his talk about educating folks about latest technologies and energy and fuel efficient vehicles. Very interesting observation here. This is uh, obviously solar panels. Government offices back here. When these panels were installed, they only offset the electricity from the grid by about 6%. It wasn't that big of a deal because there isn't very many panels. So 6% offset from the grid. Yet, after these panels were installed, energy, co electricity consumption in these office buildings was cut in half. And that's because the employees, there's a parking lot in front here, every day the employees would have to walk past these panels to get to their offices. And they had that visual reminder about energy conservation, about turning off computers, about turning off lights, and so it worked very, very well, just the whole visual thing. So in your homes or your, your companies or whatever, uh, if you get some cardboard facades that look like these panels, <laughs> put them out in front and it'll make a difference, I'm telling you. So this is how we used to manage garbage in the park. We have these in multiple locations throughout Yellowstone. Off to the side, over here with bleachers, that would hold 1,500 people at a time. And every night at a predetermined time, visitors would show up in these bleachers. Shortly thereafter, a ranger would arrive with bags of raw garbage from the hotels and dining rooms and place it on this platform. And shortly thereafter, grizzly and black bear would arrive and everybody would have that great experience of watching bears for an evening show. This went on for decades. It was another way to bring more and more people into the parks to justify having the park, period. There's a park ranger on horseback after feeding the bears. Multiple open dumps purposely placed near roadways along the roads in Yellowstone that would bring grizzly, that would bring bears in and people could stop in their cars from the comfort of their car and see bears. And they learned at an early age. You know, I, I wish I would have brought it. I have a video, an old video. And it's a scene like this where the parents get out of the vehicle and they've got about a 10-year-old son and these bears are mulling around and the dad has a jar of honey and he takes a big glob of honey 
and rubs it on the head of his 10-year-old son. And these bears come over and start licking the honey off, and he's getting this great photo of it. I wish I would have brought it. Anyway. <laughs> Again, bears, humans were their friends. They, they didn't, I mean, there was, no, there, there was no hostility there. So today we manage garbage a lot differently. We have over 2,000 of these bear-proof garbage cans throughout the park. They're emptied every single day, whether they're full or not, just to minimize the attraction of the bears. Even the, our garbage trucks are parked behind 10-foot high chain link fence to minimize the attraction of the bears. Another one of the greening initiatives that we launched in the 90s was to look at how we manage garbage. All 4,000 tons of garbage generated in Yellowstone was being hauled 150 miles away to the landfill in Logan, Montana. So we began to look at how can we reduce the amount of trips, the amount of garbage that goes into a hole in the ground 150 miles away. We instituted a very aggressive recycling effort in the park. Again, the challenges of Yellowstone, all of those recycling containers had to be specially fabricated out of heavy gauge steel so they were bear proof. It has been a very successful program. We've got over 120 of these bear proof containers throughout the park. We collect everything plastics, glass, cardboard, paper, you name it, we collect it. We have a very, very progressive uh, recycling broker that we sell to. We had a private contractor analyze all of our garbage and we found that 40% of all of Yellowstone's garbage is food waste just because of the business we're in. As a result of realizing this, uh, we decided we could produce a very rich compost with our garbage. We partnered with um, the state of Montana and surrounding counties, the city of West Yellowstone, and got the funding to construct a regional composting facility uh, that's been online since 2005. Today, that compost, and since 2005, that composting facility accepts every single piece of garbage generated in Yellowstone Park. Every single piece ends up on the floor of this compost facility. This is one morning's garbage from the Old Faithful area. We have been working with, the con with our concessioners to color code the bags. One color is compostable garbage, the other is non-compostable, so this guy doesn't have to break open every single bag and sort out what's going on. By the way, all of this garbage is sorted by this guy and by other folks by hand. Compostable, non-compostable. So there comes the importance of recycling on the front end. If, a, if you take that pop can and throw it into the dumpster versus the recycling bin, that pop can is going to go all, if it's in the dumpster, it's going to go all the way to the compost facility, have to be resorted, picked up, and transported again. Versus if it goes in the recycling container, it's gone. So anyway, uh, one of the things that What's most important about this compost facility is we are able to do a visual of our garbage every single day. We can, because most people, you don't know what's in that, what's in the dumpster. We are able to look at this pile of garbage and see what we want to take on next to eliminate, reduce, or recycle on the front end so it doesn't make it down here. One of the first things we noticed the day this facility opened was the amount of small, shampoo bottles. Again, we've got 2,000 hotel rooms in the park. Just like any hotel in the country, it's got those small shampoo bottles. They were clogging up the entire compost process. We worked with our concessioners, and today all of the shampoo bottles are all compostable, cornstarch-based bottles. So we don't mind seeing them in the waste stream or at the compost facility, because after 12 weeks of the compost process, they're disintegrated and part of compost. They also, when a bar of soap gets small, you end up tossing it away. The concessioners now are issuing out in all the hotel rooms bars of soap without any center. So there's nothing to throw away. Plus it's a nice handle. All of the plastics generated in the park are now compostable, cornstarch based. All cutlery, to-go containers, juice drinks, Everything in the park is all compostable plastics. 
no styrofoam. We also are installing water refilling stations at all the general stores and visitor centers in the park to eliminate some of the plastic water bottles that are generated in the park, which I'll talk about in a second. Next thing we noticed at the compost facility, which we never had a clue of, these are these small one pound propane cylinders that are 60 million of these things are in the US every year. Non-recyclable, non-refillable, there's nothing else to do with these things but end up in the landfill. This is one day's worth at the compost facility. And that's because it's a national park. Everybody's got these for their lanterns, their stoves, their heaters, and when they're through with their vacation, they have no choice but to throw them into the dumpster. And they end up at the comp. This is a very dangerous situation too. All of these cylinders all contain some level of propane. Now, of course, an explosive gas. So we called recycling centers around the country, around the world, Nobody, nobody had a solution of what to do with these things short of ending up in the landfill. We talked to Coleman Company, who has got 98% of the market of these cylinders. They refuse to embark in any kind of a partnership to solve this issue. So, we solved it ourselves. This is the world's first ever propane recycling unit. Obviously, it's on a trailer. This thing will do a thousand cylinders a day. What it does is it takes the cylinders, purges all remaining propane out, and stores it in those two white tanks. That same propane that has just been recovered is used to power a generator and compressor that takes the cylinder and punctures it and flattens it, which now can be redeemed as high quality steel at any recycling center. Oh, great. Thanks. There are now eight, no, now nine, nine other national parks that have bought one of these trailers. All of the national parks in Canada have one of these trailers. The state parks in Florida, um, and, it's, and soon the uh, city of um, Indianapolis. So it's catching on. Uh, we worked with a small engineering company out of Billings, Montana that helped develop it. But anyway, it's been a huge success. Uh, not one single penny of taxpayer dollars was used. Uh, for the funding of this $50,000 project. It was all done through the concessioners in both Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Park, as well as such partners as Amerigas, who supplies the majority of the propane for these cylinders nationwide, gave us 10,000. Worthington Cylinder Company, which actually manufactures the cylinders, gave us 10,000. And REI, who has a real guilt about selling the cylinders, gave us 10,000. <laughs> So it's been a huge, in two weeks we had, we were turning down partners. We had more than enough money. Did Coleman ever had a change of heart at all? Funny you should ask that. <laughs> so after we developed the trailer, Coleman comes out with their own solution. And you, you'll find it in any sporting goods store when you buy a Coleman cylinder. It's called the green key. It's a little plastic insert that's inside the cap. They give you instructions on the label when you're through with that cylinder and you're through camping and it's time to go home and there's still propane in that cylinder, you take this little green insert, you push it into the neck of the cylinder and over the next three hours any remaining propane will be expelled into the atmosphere. And that's their answer. And they wanted Yellowstone to pilot that program and we just had real heartburn thinking that we were going to encourage visitors to release an explosive greenhouse gas into our atmosphere and once, even if it did remove all the propane, what are you going to do with that cylinder? There's not, let me show you, whoops, there's not, a, there's not a recycling center in the country that'll take a propane cylinder unless there's ironclad proof that there is no more propane in that cylinder. And the only way to do that is to <coughs> puncture it and flatten it. So with Coleman's answer of putting this green key and expelling the propane, we said, what are we going to do with that cylinder now? Nobody's going to take it because there's no proof that it's empty. Anyway, they said they spent $685,000 tooling up for this green key. And they could have bought a dozen of those trailers. Anyway, there's more to the story. <laughs> <laughs>
So the next thing that we noticed at the compost facility was bear spray. Not a big deal in a lot of parks back east, but certainly in Yellowstone, Teton, and some of the other western parks. Again, no solution. These things are ending up in the landfill because there's nothing else to do with them. When that one of those containers ends up on the floor of the compost facility, and one of our when that equipment operator runs over that, that building has to be evacuated for hours. Um, so we have invented the world's first ever bear spray recycling unit. It takes the bear spray, purges out the contents, which is basically um, uh, cayenne pepper and a propellant. That's all there really is to it. And we recycle those two elements, and then that aluminum container is crushed and flattened and recycled. So that's what the propane cylinder looks like after it's processed. Again, a thousand a day. Uh, last year, we estimating 45,000 cylinders, 40,000 the year before. This is without really even trying. We're just putting recycling <coughs> bins out in all the campgrounds. And the visitors are filling them up with, with, with cylinders. It's amazing. And we recycle and pulverize all the glass collected in the park. There's a pile of Yellowstone glass. Uh, either it can be very, it can be pulverized coarse like this, or very fine like sandbox sand that we use to sand the roads uh, in and around the park. Here is Yellowstone glass that's been pulverized, being used in a pervious parking lot in Billings, Montana. Parking lots, uh, um, playgrounds, and pathways throughout Montana and Wyoming. That's all Yellowstone glass. So instead of feeling good about recycling and not knowing what's, where your product's going, we're trying to reuse back into the park. There's a small company out of Bozeman that is taking Yellowstone pulverized glass and turning it in. They're, what they're doing is they're heating it up, uh, melting it, molding it, and making it into the bathroom tile. Uh, and they've got now a two-year backlog on, on bathroom tile. These people in these high-end homes like around Bozeman and Big Sky, they want a piece of Yellowstone in their homes, and especially bathroom tile. They can say it came from Yellowstone, whatever. <laughs> anyway, this is high-end uh, bathroom tile made out of Perrier and Tangeray bottles. Very high-end out of Bombay gin and Sky Vodka bottles. <laughs> and your normal wine and beer bottles. <laughs> but it's, it's, a, it's a hell of a gig they got going and they're doing really well at it. Um, the concessioners generate around 11,000, that's a historic photograph of Old Faithful Inn. Uh, concessioners uh, have been, uh, they are producing around 11,000 gallons of cooking grease every year, every summer, and that was all being either rendered or taken to the landfill 150 miles away. Now we've developed a refining process. All of that used cooking grease never leaves the park. It's being used in the heating boilers at the Old Faithful Inn and at the Mammoth Hotel. A snapshot of what we recycled last year. I'm not going to go into detail, but what I really want to point out is last year, 45 tons of plastic generated or collected in Yellowstone. Almost all of that plastic water bottles. It's just unbelievable. So we followed the trail of these plastics after they were collected in the park. They were sold to a broker in Bozeman, then the plastics were resold to a broker in Seattle, then they were shipped to China. All of Yellowstone's plastics were going to China. Not a good, not, not a real good thing. So we, were, we, we thought we were feeling good about collecting that much plastics until we figured out and realized where it was going. So to get out of that, we embarked in a partnership with the carpet industry of, in Dalton, Georgia. That's Yellowstone plastics from one summer, all bailed up. That plastics is all now going to Spartansburg, North Carolina, where it's shredded and then shipped to Dalton, Georgia, where it's used in the manufacture of carpet backing, the underside of the carpet, for all the major carpet manufacturers in the country. The first and it's also using soybean oil. So it's going from uh, Yellowstone 
to Georgia, and then the first batch of carpet uh, with Yellowstone plastics uh, came back to Yellowstone. Again, a closed loop story, full circle. It was installed at the Old Faithful Snow Lodge uh, a year ago last spring. There's also been Yellowstone uh, plastic carpet, backed carpet, uh, installed in hotels in West Yellowstone, in Jackson, and in Bozeman, as well as Fort Bragg and other military installations. Um, the carpet folks are no fools. Uh, they're making a big marketing deal out of this, which is, the, which is fine. They, they're calling it the Yellowstone Collection, so it's got that iconic name, and the colors are geyser gray, bison brown. You know, <laughs> they're playing it up and it's working, so I mean, good for them. And it's expanded now into the Tetons, all of the Tetons plastics, as well as many of the surrounding national forests, all of their plastics are going that same route to Georgia and back into the Yellowstone ecosystem. Uh, this is the one of the this is the Holiday Inn in West Yellowstone, <coughs> Fort Bragg dormitory, uh, the viewing platform at Old Faithful, uh, that is all recycled plastic lumber. Uh, that's next time you stand on it, all of that lumber has the equivalent of, <coughs> equivalent of about 3 million plastic melt jugs. Uh, diversion rate away from the landfill, uh, we don't understand it, but uh, we went down. We don't have 2012 figures yet, but we went down a little bit. We think people, visitors, are producing less garbage. Uh, they're recycling more. Whatever the reason, this is the, what we divert away from the landfill. Um, 75 to 80 percent of all of our garbage never makes it to that hole in the ground. That's an unheard of figure. When the average stay of the visitor is a day and a half, that's the amount of time we have to educate the visitor about how to do things right with their garbage. Plus, there's language barriers on top of that. Most communities in the country, I don't know what Boise or Idaho is, most communities target 20 to 22 percent diversion, and they're lucky if they get it. And here we are with a very transient population able to make those kinds of figures and it's through education. Uh, cleaning products, we used to have 140 products in the park for cleaning and janitorial business. You need to understand that the janitorial business in Yellowstone is a big deal. We've got employees that do nothing but clean the same restroom all day long in the middle of the summer because there's so many people. When there's 5,000 people watching Old Faithful erupt, and when it's through, they have to erupt. <laughs> the restrooms get very busy. So anyway, these 139 products we were using all contain some level of, to of toxicity, either to the employee or the environment or both. So we set up strict criteria. I won't go into detail, but the products had the new products had to be non-aerosol, non-corrosive, naturally derived, on and on. We found a, a company in Lincoln, Nebraska that met our criteria. We went from 140 products down to six. We buy in bulk and in concentrate form, uh, height and morale with the janitorial staff, uh, no more nausea and runny eyes and headaches uh, day after day from this janitorial staff. This has been replicated by dozens and dozens of other national parks, as well as, because uh, I've been working with the national parks in Canada, they have switched, as well as, I just got through working with, uh, and continuing to work with the Galapagos Islands, and they're switching. <laughs> believe it or not. Anyway, Yellowstone, one of my last stories, Yellowstone in winter. Uh, first snowmobile in the park in 1921. Uh, a very controversial issue emerged uh, in, into the 90s. Uh, too many snowmobiles in the park uh, versus it's my right to be in the park with a snowmobile. Still an ongoing controversy. Uh, I understand both sides. Uh, in the year 2000, we had over 80,000 snowmobiles in Yellowstone. Uh, major concerns, noise pollution, air pollution, wildlife disturbance, and employee health. We have employees that are collecting money in those kiosks, breathing that blue haze all day. Um, so we proposed a complete ban on snowmobiles in the year 2000. Uh, we were sued uh, by the snowmobile manufacturers and the state of Wyoming. We're still in litigation today. Um, we have, the judge has allowed temporary measures in place that help us
to manage this issue. Um, the snowmobile industry, rightfully so, is saying, hey, wait a minute, what about all these motor homes in the summer? So you got this, you got this ping pong going back and forth. But anyway, um, we now limit the number of snowmobiles that can enter the park on any given day. They have to be clean, quiet snowmobiles, no more two-stroke uh, uh, polluting machines. Uh, you have to have a guide when you enter the park. There's no snowmobiling at night. You have to have a driver's license, a number of things in place, and um, it's, it's, it's being accepted fairly well. I mean, it's, we, we, we had to do something, but in any event, it, this is how bad it was. This is at one of our gas stations in the park before we got a handle on this. Very expensive operation during the winter. We have to groom all of our 400 miles of road every single night. These are these same groomers they use on ski hills uh, to provide that smooth, hard-packed surface for the safety of the snowmobiler. Um, the bison have figured out it's a lot easier to walk on this hard-packed surface <laughs> than it is in the powder snow. So this 40-foot wide corridor gets very busy with wildlife and skiers and snowmobilers and snow coaches. This is not uncommon. Bison are very tolerant, uh, but still there's incidents where they've just had enough. <coughs> Bison always wins. We still have habituation of wildlife like the olden days with the bears. I took this picture because it, it illustrates it, be it summer or winter, I don't mean to pick on the winter users, but uh, this is down in the Old Faithful area. This coyote had learned to lay down in the middle of the road, and when a group of snowmobilers would come up, they'd have to stop because he's laying on the road. And they would take pictures, and eventually they would toss him a cracker or a piece of sandwich or something. After he got rewarded, he would move out of the way, let the snowmobilers by, go back to the middle of the road and lay down and wait for the next group. And he was very good at doing this all day long. We relocated him twice to different areas of the park and twice he came back to this exact same spot exhibiting the same type of behavior. And finally he had to be put down. Because he was getting closer and closer and less fearful of humans. Even birds get into the action. Just before I took this picture, this uh, we call them camp robbers. This bird had used his beak to open the zipper of this fanny pack to take the lunch out. <laughs> <laughs> so we wanted to do something. Po this is, I mean, this was a very, it still is a very emotional, controversial issue. This whole snowmobile thing. So we wanted to do something positive. In the year 2000, uh, we created the Clean Snowmobile Challenge. We challenged universities around the country to develop a clean, quiet snowmobile without compromising performance or reliability. We didn't want it to invent some contraption that wouldn't be sellable. We wanted a, a real shelf-ready snowmobile that could be marketed. That first year, in the year 2000, we had seven schools respond. And this is a week-long week event. Um, and of course, the most important events during that week are noise and air pollution testing, as well as endurance cold weather starting, um, on and on and on. That first year, the year 2000, the Colorado School of Mines here in front, wrought, they won the overall competition by reducing emissions by 99, over 99%. Something the industry said could not be done. The industry at this time was like Coleman. They, wanted, they, they were in denial that there was an issue. They said the two stroke was the best that could ever be. Nothing could ever improve on it, go away. And so that's when we started this. Unlike Coleman, the snowmobile industry has done a complete about face. They're deeply engaged in this competition, financially and otherwise, and have been a great supporter of it. As a matter of fact, these kids that are seniors are being hired by the snowmobile industry before they even graduate. So a whole industry has been spun around. It's, it's been a great success story. We still have the competition today. We just got through last week. Um, between 15 and 17 schools every year from around the country um, and it's very entertaining. These kids uh, will stop at nothing to uh, develop a clean, quiet snowmobile. This, these were the universities that were in uh, this past week. Wow. 
universally number one uh, first place finish with a hybrid snowmobile. University of Idaho, Moscow, which has been in the competition since the beginning in 2000, uh, came in third. Uh, they used, they're, they're, I wish they'd win one of these years. They're second <laughs> or third every year. Uh, and their technology, they're developing is unique to any other of these schools. University of Idaho is taking the two-stroke, smelly, noisy snowmobile and making it into a clean, quiet snowmobile. Most of the other schools are going to four-stroke or hybrid or electric or biodiesel, whatever, but University of Idaho is sticking with that two-stroke concept and they're doing really a good job at it. Really a good job. And uh, North Dakota, their machine started on a fire, so they didn't get very far. <laughs> In any event, Great competition uh, that's been very successful. That's been a model for the, for the whole country. Preferred mode of travel, two years ago, visitation by snow coach in Yellowstone exceeded visitation by snowmobile. People are beginning to realize it's a little more comfortable and a lot more educational to be in a van with a, with a driver that can interpret the features of the park than being on a snowmobile at 30 below, not even knowing what you're looking at. So it, it's, it's actually working out. And it gives business to the gateway communities and these guides and outfitters that are trying to make a living. So the, the snowmobilers, aside from the noise and pollution, we're, we're having a problem with like enforcement about, unlike a, a, a car where out there, they can go anywhere. They're not limited to the road. So how are you Snowmobiles have their issue. Um, we only, as you saw, we groom only the road corridors and if these snowmobiles get off of that corridor, they're in eight feet of powder and they'll make that mistake once. But you're right, and what we have is rangers on snowmobiles that are equipped with, with lights and sirens and speed guns and the whole thing. Yeah, it's just like a vehicle for law enforcement. But you're right, they're especially on the west end of the park or by Island Park area, there's a lot of trespassing and boundary encroachment that happens in that area, just because they've always done it. Last story real fast, the fires of 88 that I mentioned. Um, this was a press release from July 21st of 1988. The black is the size and locations of the park, or of the fires at the time, right? That was July and that was September. Over 25,000 firefighters, over $100 million. Not a single thing worked, not one single fire line held. I was there the whole summer. Um, again, to date, the largest single firefighting effort in US history. Oh, even the military, the Navy, the Army, and the Marines. Nothing worked. The only thing that worked was in late September, uh, an inch of snow overnight. So again, lesson learned, you don't put out fires at least naturally cause fires because the fuel's going to build up and you're going to get into this scenario again. The last two summers we had 10,000 acre, uh, last fall, 10,000 acre fire. We didn't touch it. We let it burn. We monitored it. <coughs> we we kind of worked the flanks, but prior to 88, we would have thrown a million dollars at it and thousands of firefighters just to put it out. And now we don't. So, huge education shift. That was the firestorm rolling into the Old Faithful area uh, with the fear that we were going to lose the Old Faithful <laughs> Inn. Uh, thankfully, a last minute shift of the winds and those huge parking lots in the Old Faithful area which acted as fire breaks. So we're working with Georgia Tech on bio-inspired design where we look at what nature is doing. This is getting off of Yellowstone just for a second what nature is doing and how man can replicate it. Um, what animal helped create a better cell phone screen? Birds, because the colors you see in your skin or your hair, those, those are pigments. And birds, are, bird feathers for example, they have little tiny bubbles on their feathers that when white light hits it, it reflects, or refracts different colors like a prism. And that's what gives like peacocks and butterflies their enormous bright colors. And they're looking at that to develop uh, brighter colors for, for example, on cell phones. I'm just citing a couple examples here. What animal makes a better hearing aid? 
Who knows this? Frog. Modern day hearing aids, all they do is amplify everything coming in. Frogs have a way of amplifying only the sounds they want to have amplified and not the background noise. So scientists are looking at developing hearing aids that replicate what the frog is doing. Ice axe technology, uh, a lot of manufacturers are looking at woodpeckers because of the way their body is shaped and the way they can take repeated blows to the head and reduce the shock to their body and have that same technology into an ice axe, for example. <laughs> Trains quieter. The owls, the way those large wings at the, or large feathers at the end of their wings, they separate, allowing air to go through, really reducing the amount of noise that owls make so they can hunt at night. And that same technology was used in the design. Of, that's, the, that's the bullet train from uh, Tokyo. It goes 200 miles an hour. What animal uh, makes street signs glow in the dark? Cats. You guys all have seen it in the headlights when you see a cat or any nocturnal animal, the way that light is reflecting back from their eyes. Um, and that, that feature is being used in reflective signing throughout the U.S. Uh, again, the bullet train. Uh, what, what animals make it easier for these trains to go through tunnels and to uh, be more aerodynamically streamlined, and that is the kingfisher. Uh, you can see the resemblance there. What animal makes cars go faster or safer? <laughs> Big horn sheep that take blows up to 24 hours at a time during mating season. Uh, uh, the force is so great, it's the same as you in your vehicle hitting a brick wall at 40 miles an hour and do that all day long. So the marrow and the bone structure in the bighorn sheep uh, is being looked at for bumper design. What animals keep our medicines from spoiling? Wood frogs. Wood frogs go into complete hibernation in the wintertime to the point where they are frozen except their body tissue and their body tissue is kept from freezing through uh, an increase in sugar in their, in their blood. And scientists are looking at replicating that to, to keep medicines fresher, longer, on and on. And lastly, where did Velcro come from? Spore edges. What's that? Spore edges. What is that? It's a plant. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> it was 70 years ago, a Swedish guy was walking his dog. And those cockle burrs were sticking to his pants, and he developed the, the hook and loop system uh, that today is Velcro. Good one. Okay. <laughs> Didn't mean to get off track here. Anyway, <laughs> last slide. So this is, uh, who knows what this is? You probably don't because it's extremely rare to see. It's, it's Steamboat Geyser uh, in the Norris Geyser Basin of Yellowstone. The largest geyser on the planet. Uh, four times taller than Old Faithful. Uh, prior to 1961, it was dormant for 50 years. Uh, it's, it went off uh, a couple of times since then, but it went off on May 5th of 2001 at 5 o'clock in the morning. The only people who witnessed it was a family that was illegally camped in these trees. When it went off, they took these phenomenal color, first ever, color pictures, and shortly thereafter, rangers arrived, struck a deal where they would not be arrested for illegally camping if they surrendered the negatives. And so what you're seeing here is the first color pictures of Steamboat, and its last eruption was October of 2005. And that uh, will throw debris up to a quarter mile away. Anyway, one last picture, and that is uh, we have a lot of dignitaries that have visited Yellowstone, uh, 12 U.S. presidents. I escorted two and a half, two presidents and a vice president, uh, countless congressmen and senators, European royalty, movie stars, you name it. But I think the most important visitors we had in the park was in 1950, 1969, the Three Stooges. <laughs> <laughs> Picture taken in the Old Faithful area, a classic. 
found it in the archives. <laughs> Actually, I call it the Six Stooges. <laughs> anyway, thanks, folks. Thanks for sitting through this.